Hello everyone and welcome to the CircuitPython Weekly for July 8th, 2019. Uh, this is the time that we all get together to talk about uh, CircuitPython and everything uh, related to it. Um, we hold this meeting every week, uh, or typically every week, um, on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, if we have a U.S. holiday, sometimes we will move it. If you check the CircuitPython channel on Discord, uh, we usually post notices of changes. Um, and speaking of Discord, that is where we host this meeting. Um, we host it in the audio chat and also in the CircuitPython uh, text channel. And this meeting is recorded. Uh, we do have notes for it and we do post a video. Um, and we were recording the Discord screen, so everything that is both said and typed um, is available for later uh, viewing. Um, if you're not into watching videos and you're more into podcasts, we also have this posted to many podcast services. If you find that we are not on your favorite one, please let us know uh, so we can get that fixed up. Um, I am Katni. Uh, I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. Uh, as well as a couple other folks in the chat. Um, CircuitPython development is sponsored by Adafruit, uh, so please support them by visiting uh, adafruit.com and purchasing hardware. Um, this meeting is held in five parts. Uh, the first part is community news, where we talk about th Py CircuitPython related or Python on hardware or any kind of Python related things. Um, uh, that are going on in the community. The next section is State of CircuitPython in the Libraries, which is a statistical overview of the project, both from the position of the core and the libraries. The next section is Hug Reports, where we give a chance to um, call people out for doing something good. Uh, the section after that is Status Updates, both of which is a, an opportunity to sort of give an overview of what you've done over the last week and what you're going to be doing over the next week. Um, both status updates and hug reports are done in a round robin where uh, whoever's running the meeting will start and then we will go through the list alphabetically. Uh, if at any time you are unable to join the meeting um, or you are just lurking or you don't uh, want to um, read anything off, you can actually put your notes in the notes document and we will read them off as we go. Um, just let us know that you're lurking or text only or um, won't be attending the meeting. And the final section is in the weeds, which is where we have more long form discussions. Um, sometimes things that come out of status updates, other times if you just come up with something that you think is more of an in the weeds topic, please uh, feel free to add it to in the weeds um, in the notes or type it out in the CircuitPython text channel and we will get it added and get to it at the end. Um, so with that, uh, I will turn it over to Phil for community news. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. All right. Uh, we still have CircuitPython Day coming up pretty soon. It is 8-8-2019. There are a couple events there in the newsletter and blog posts and more, and I'm also putting them in the chat. Um, if you uh, like snooping around GitHub, and find in Scott's presentations like I do. Um, Scott's presentation from Teardown is out also coverage from Hackaday. So all of the things from Teardown, I think we got most of the uh, coverage and more. Um, we also have past presentations in uh, the CircuitPython art folder that's on Dropbox, including some videos and more. Because sometimes when you search for things on YouTube and Google, it doesn't. it's really hard to find some of these past presentations. So we have a collection of them all. Um, especially if folks want to do their own presentation about CircuitPython and they just want to grab our slides and edit them for an event. And speaking of events, um, the Pi Badger event badge guide is up. Uh, yay, Katni. So this is one of those things where if you do an event from small to large and you want a conference badge, there wasn't really any good resources how to set it up. Um, a lot of them are really expensive and don't do anything, and you can get a Pi badge for you know 30 bucks and you're off to the races. So we have a guide for that. And then last up this week is um, made with Moo News. There's the Alpha 2 release. A couple updates. One, there's so many CircuitPython boards out there that instead of it just saying Adafruit, now it says CircuitPython. And the other thing that's really interesting is the web mode. So it's a very easy to use uh, Flask entity, Flask-like thing that 
you can code Python and make little websites. So check out all those things. Um, test it out because every time there's a release, um, make sure our our boards work. And with that, here's community news. Thanks, Phil. Bye bye. All right. So next up is the state of Circuit Python and the libraries. Um, so we will uh, talk about um, overall what the situation is. Uh, then we'll talk about the core, and then we'll talk about the libraries. Um, this, like I said, is a statistical overview of the general state of the whole project um, and uh, gives us just a chance to see where things are at um, in terms of numbers. So first, overall, we had 15 pull requests merged by nine authors. Um, we have uh, one new author I don't recognize, which is uh, T. Jekyll. Um, we had five reviewers, and we had nine issues closed by eight people, and five opened by five people. Um, overall, the situation as, uh, as we are, we have um, for uh, we have we have a four stable out and we have a 4.1 um beta out <clears throat> and uh we're working towards a 4.1 stable uh pretty quickly um and then as well we are uh working on some ble stuff that is going to potentially lead to a five um alpha or beta as well um so we're working we're working quickly towards that uh 4.1 has a lot of speed ups and a lot of uh, great things in it that uh, are leading us to want to get that stable as soon as possible. Um, but we're definitely still uh, working with um, making sure that we have that solid uh, before we bump that to stable. Um, and uh, as for the libraries, we are still getting a lot of work done on those um, new ones uh, each week. Uh, so thank you to everyone who's been contributing to that. And the more uh, hardware we get out, the more libraries we need, and the more libraries we get out, um, and obviously the bigger CircuitPython becomes. So uh, that's been really good. Um, and uh, with that, um, I will hand it over to Scott for talking about the core. Thank you so much. All right. Um, in the last week, we had three pull requests merged uh, from two different authors, myself and Deshibu. We have eight open pull requests. Uh, they're listed in the notes doc here. Uh, this list does change a little bit as we get through stuff, um, but that's as of today. Um, issues wise, we had three closed issues by three people and two open by two people. So we're net down one, which is good uh, for a total of 180 open issues, which feels like we've slowly increased a little bit, but um, we'll take a stab at that and uh, get it down. We have two issues without a milestone, which uh, we don't like to have. So uh, those are worth taking a look at. Uh, we have one open issue for 4.1, and then we have three open issue bug fix issues with 4.x.x as well. Um, those are the kind of key milestones that we're looking at currently. Uh, downloads wise, uh, 4.02 is the latest stable and 410 beta one uh, is the latest stable as well. This is uh, true for last week as well. So the download numbers are uh, 1,471 for stable release and 204 for the unstable release. Um, pretty much on trend, uh, you know, a few hundred each week. Uh, download stats by language are in the notes doc as well, but I will not read those off. If you're curious, we do have a total of one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven languages, uh, which is interesting, and I can never remember exactly how many languages there are. So, uh, thank you to everyone uh, who continues to test both the unstable and the stable releases. Back to you. All right, thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in terms of the libraries, we had twelve pull requests merged by eight authors. Um, TG Cal is uh, in that list, so thank you again for uh, new contributors and five reviewers. We have 30 open pull requests. Um, the list of those is in the notes, uh, as well as being available on circuitpython.org, which I will talk about in a moment. Um, we had six issues closed by five people and three open by three people, leaving us with 103 open issues. If you visit uh, circuitpython.org slash libraries slash contributing, you will find all of the open pull requests, all of the open issues, 
um, as well as some library infrastructure issues that are essentially uh, based around the fact that we have standards that we like to keep for the libraries uh, to make it easier to maintain. And as we uh, grow in terms of what those standards are, uh, some of the older libraries no longer meet those standards. So we try to um, keep track of that. We have a series of checks and um, any of these from the open pull request to the open issues to the open library infrastructure problems um, are great ways to get started contributing to CircuitPython. So if you are interested in contributing, but maybe you don't know C, maybe you are just getting started, um, all of these uh, include some stuff that is beginner friendly, some stuff that is more complicated. Um, basically any level of uh, your experience uh, can probably be met by something. Um, one of the great ways to start is to uh, review pull requests because there can be simple things such as typos, uh, spelling errors, grammar errors, that sort of thing. If you don't um, actually know how to program, uh, there's still ways for you to uh, help us out. So if you have any questions about using Git and GitHub, uh, feel free to ping us. There is a guide written about that, about how we do our workflow um, with contributing to CircuitPython. And so uh, that is available um, and we can point you to that and we'll always be able to help you out. So feel free to ping us in the CircuitPython channel if you have any questions. Um, we had uh, one new library in the last week, and that's uh, PyBadger. Um, and then we had uh, three updated libraries, which is the RA8875, the PN532, and Cursor Control. Um, those are all listed in the notes uh, and are usually available on circuitpython.org slash libraries if you're ever interested in where the libraries are going. And with that, uh, that is the state of CircuitPython and the libraries. Next up is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a chance to call people out for doing something good, uh, which is not something that happens often enough. Um, we actually took this from an internal Adafruit meeting thing where they do the same thing um, with hug reports. And so we decided to do it as well. Uh, it's sort of our counter to bug reports, if you will. Uh, we'll go through the list in a round robin. I will start as an example, and then I will continue down the list in um, alphabetical order. Uh, if you are lurking, let us know and we will skip over you. If you are text only, let us know and we will read it off. Um, and again, if you're listening to this later and you want um, to be able to add notes and you're not able to attend the meeting, uh, feel free to find the notes doc uh, before the meeting and add your notes and just let us know that you're missing the meeting and we'll read it off. So with that, I will get started. Um, so I want to give a hug report to DC Brichetti um, for a learn guide code update. It was uh, a much cleaner way to do a particular example. The only issue was that the example is more designed to be for beginners. Um, so I asked them to contribute their version of it um, to, uh, to the same repo so that it's available if people are interested. Um, but that, uh, and they seemed to think that was a great idea. So I'm really glad that that, that uh, worked out. Um, it took something like 20 lines of code and turned it into like six. Uh, so it was it was a very well done, um, well done update. Uh, so thank you to them for that. I uh, want to give a hard report to Roy for continuing to help me with my keynote um, and to Sedacious for talking through some things regarding my keynote. Um, and we have a lurker. And so next up is Lady Ada. Lady Ada is perhaps away. We can return to her. Let's go to Maker Melissa and we'll come back to Lady Ada when she shows up. Hello. Hello. Okay, let's see. Uh, I wanted to give a hug report to Hulko for um, getting another display working in Display IO and just a group hug to everyone. All right. Thanks. Um, next up is Sedacious. Uh, howdy. Uh, just a general group hug to everybody, and especially, as usual, I'll continue to do good things to keep the community a great place to be. Thanks. All right. 
Um, next up is Summersoft, who is not in the meeting but has notes. Um, it is a group hug from Summersoft. So that means next up is Scott. Hello. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thanks to Carlos for taking time on his weekend to work with me on the RGB LED status stuff. Uh, we had maybe like a three hour voice chat about all that stuff. So excited to see him get ramped up. Um, thanks to my friend Galen for brain power towards uh, poking the touch IO stuff with the SAMD51. Uh, not a lot of progress, but um, definitely uh, figured out what our hurdles are. Uh, so thanks to Galen. Uh, thanks to J&J Studios for the data and board support uh, PR uh, that came in. Uh, we'll get that in soon. Thanks to Ben Holt for the simple I.O. fix. Um, thanks to DC Brichetti again uh, for the sample code fixes in the Adafruit Learn Guide uh, repo. And finally, thank you to RCE1086 uh, for the UART TX fix. We were actually claiming to be able to do UART on pins that we shouldn't have on the same D51. And uh, RCE both filed the issue and has now has a, has a pull request for it as well. So thanks to them. And that's it for me. All right, thanks. Next up is CG Techie. Hi, just a community hug for keeping it a great and open play. All right, thanks. Uh, and that means next up is Brent. Hello, um, hug to Davis Bells for helping me discover some bugs within cursor control and submitting pull requests so I didn't have to fix them. It was awesome. And for Adam, who works on Adafruit IO, for helping me with the nitty gritty of the MQTT spec. He like knows everything. That's it. All right, right on. Thank you. Um, that means next up is Dan. Hi. Uh, just one this week. Thanks. Uh, echoing what Scott said. Thanks to RC one hundred six for the new art uh, pad computation fix, which was really nice to have somebody else do that okay all right thanks um so dakota has a uh hug report um after all so i will read that off right quick um kind of multitasking but dogpile group hug for the whole wonderful community and next up is jerry uh hey i'll just echo the uh Many group hugs. Hey, group hugs are great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and with that, that is hug reports. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, next up is status updates. Um, status updates is an opportunity for us to sync up on um, what we've been doing over the past week, what we're going to be doing over the next week, uh, an opportunity to get tips and tricks from others if you're running into any issues, um, and an opportunity to identify um, any kind of uh, things that might fit better within the weeds, um, which is uh, where we do more longer form discussions. So um, everybody will take a couple minutes, talk about what they've been doing, what they're going to be doing, and uh, we will be doing this again in a round robin alphabetically, just like we did hug reports. I will start and then uh, we'll move through the list. So, uh, and if you're lurking, let us know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, same thing applies. Um, you can, even if you're lurking, feel free to post a text uh, update um, if you happen to have one and we will read it off. So I will get started. So last week, um, <clears throat> pretty much everything I was doing was dealing with PyBadger. Um, fixed uh, an issue where I had not made the font customizable on the built-in badge function. Um, that came out of iterating on making it work in the first place and just forgetting to make that a, uh, a keyword argument that you could set. Um, so I fixed that. Uh, updated the names of the functions to include show so that it made more sense. 
um, updated all the examples with the naming updates, uh, verified that the example was good, um, which is to say, again, the initial example that was pushed to the repo was pushed simply so there was an example um, and just happened to be the working example I had. <clears throat> it wasn't, um, wasn't ready for prime time, if you will. Um, and uh, I guess a belated hug report to Melissa for helping me with a lot of that. Um, we went through a lot of different functionality and um, discussions on how the uh, different badge functions should work versus how the example should work. And um, she, we, we, there was a very complicated thing we added that dealt with um, making it non-blocking and um, Melissa's suggestion entirely got rid of that and made it much simpler. So uh, basically that was uh, a much better way to go about it. So thank you for that. Um, there is now a PyBadger guide. Uh, it covers only how to um, create an interactive badge. We haven't covered the rest of the library yet. That will get added as we go. Um, and then uh, it turns out the potential bug with displaying label over bitmap was that I was doing it wrong. Um, so it wasn't a bug. Uh, so that got fixed up um, and taken care of. So for the rest of this week, I want to finish documenting PyBadger. Um, the library itself is not well documented. The guide exists, but I want to basically have it be similar to the Circuit Playground Express library where Read the Docs has an example for everything. So I want to work on that. It needs to end up in the bundle. Um, the guide release needs to be blogged. There will be forum support, and then there is a whole host of other things um, that I need to do that were basically uh, things that were assigned while I was working on PyBadger. And um, now that PyBadger is pretty much done, uh, I have a lot of stuff to get caught up on. So, <coughs> sorry about that. Um, we, I need to, uh, Servo Kit needs something added to it. There's still a character LCD error, memory error issue that's open. Um, there's a couple libraries that need to get added to the CircuitPython Read the Docs. We're going to be writing up a guide to um, about adding a board to CircuitPython so we can stop sending the same information to people over and over. Um, so I need to put it up an outline for that. Uh, I need to finish documenting debug I squared C. Um, I need to test debug SPI because it doesn't work like expected. And then finish documenting that once we figure that out. Um, there's a bunch of different guide stuff that I need to do. And... Um, finish up some blog posts and some photo stuff. So that is uh, my, then the reason I listed it as this week and beyond is that this is definitely not all going to get done this week. Um, so that is uh, my status update. Um, I don't know if Lady Ada is back yet. I'm gonna guess not because I didn't get a text response. So let's go ahead and go to Maker Melissa. Hello. Okay, uh, let's see here. Okay, uh, last week I tested Katni's PyBadger code, as she mentioned. Um, and also I went ahead and um, finally or finished testing the changes that you made, and that was good. Um, I worked on the uh, Pi calculator uh, that I was that I'm right for the Pi portal that I'm writing a guide for, and I fixed the Pi TFT easy installer on Raspbian and Buster, and I fixed and updated the RA8875 Circuit Python library. And this week I'm going to finish testing the uh, Freak Show PR on Raspberry Pi four. Um, I'm going to finish up that Pi calculator guide and I'm going to look, uh, look into some uh, Raspberry Pi script. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Next up is Sedacious. Howdy, howdy. Uh, so last week I 
able to test the Rev V of the OLED friend. It works great. Uh, so that enabled me to start work on an OLED bonnet. And I got that off to Fab last week before heading out on vacation. So I was out from Wednesday morning through yesterday evening. So didn't get a lot of other stuff done. I did some forum moderation and a little bit of sport here and there. Um, but uh, I definitely have some catching up to do. So uh, this week, I'll be working on testing some boards that I got in the mail while I was gone, including a VCNL 4040 Rev B, I think, or C. Um, also another uh, test board for a module that we're working on validating and using in some other stuff. Uh, so I also have to do a guide probably for the VCNL 4040 and some other stuff that I've either forgotten or haven't come up yet. So, yep, that's it for me. All right. Thanks. Next up is Summersoft, who may or may not still be lurking. I am going to vote lurking, so I will read off the notes. Last week, continued workcation, which ends today's sad face. Dynamic RTD module support matrix. Had to change a couple things to make it Python 3.5 compatible for Travis. Now getting a Travis failure on Sphinx build, which I'm thinking is bash command related, semicolon versus uh, ampersands. Um, this week, uh, finish support matrix and back to Rosie Pi work. Excellent. Next up is Scott. Hello. Um, okay, so this week I'm finishing up or yeah, finishing up display IO work to add support for other color depths. So we support 16-bit right now, uh, but I want to support uh, 1, 2, and 4-bit as well. Uh, and that will be grayscale. I was really uh, hung up about how to have that work. Um, and, but I think I ended up to the point of like palette is going to store the original 24-bit color you give it. And then you'll be able to read it back as well. And then it will determine kind of how to down, down sample that color depending on the given display. So um, we'll document how that's done. So if you want to have like fine control over, over what shows up as yellow on your ink, you'd be able to. Uh, but I want to have some sane kind of defaults so that you can take code, move it between displays, and have it not look absolutely terrible. So. Uh, that's my goal with that. Um, and I think I've gotten myself over a lot of those like mental blocks. So hoping to have something working by the end of the week this week. And I think there's like three issues that I'll knock out all at once, which would be cool. Um, over the weekend, I had a friend come over who does security stuff. So we were um, poking around at the uh, not documented SAMD51 touch stuff this weekend. Uh, ran into some code blocks, but uh, we are poking at that uh, from time to time. Uh, yeah, so this week's challenge is uh, the tough part about the display work is all of it's currently geared towards being able to write 16-bit values directly, whereas now uh, with these lower color uh, or lower bit depth colors, we'll have to be doing uh, bit masking uh, sort and bit packing sorts of things. So that's going to be and different displays do it differently as well, like whether you pack a column's worth of pixels into one byte or a row's worth of pixels into one byte. Um, so there's going to be, I always end up <laughs> right in the same function that like computes all the pixels. Um, so yeah, that'll be fun, but uh, I'd love to get e-ink support going uh, with that. And then lastly, uh, Katni and I are recording uh, a podcast called embedded.fm on Saturday. Uh, so there may be some pre-work associated with that as well. So uh, that's it for me. Uh, I'll let you take it away. Uh, yeah, I totally forgot to mention the uh, podcast. Yes, we are both doing that. Mm -hmm. And we'll definitely have some stuff to be doing beforehand. Um, all right. Next up is TG Techie. Hello. So um, can't speak much for the last week since the last four weeks I've been out of state. And I've finally gotten back to typing Python code, and it feels so good. Um, so I've been porting my GUI stuff over to Displayio and changing how apps are written, because it's not widespread, so you can change the whole thing if you want. Uh, um, they're widespread in one person. 
um, and hopefully it should make it clearer with some decorators that mean that you don't have to pass the things that you need to every time and it's kind of laborious um, and given a month to think of a pokey out I, I think I think I have a good idea of how to do it and now that I'm back at a device that can run circuit python I will start working on that yeah and take a take a look at the cursor control work that Brent did it's a very similar problem okay yeah, there's a cursor control library now that I think does similar detection of like, what are you over? Got it. That I will definitely take a look at. Thank you. Cool. All right. Sounds great. Thank you. Next up is Brent. Hello. This past week, I've been doing a lot of work on mini MQTT, which isn't so many, so I might do a rename before release. Um, it's the MQTT library for CircuitPython. Um, a lot of just work on making sure it conforms to MQTT spec. Um, implementing the specification as hard as I can, which is quite difficult because it's very dense. Um, and then having a lot of Pythonic um, parts to it, so like you could give it multiple subscribes, multiple unsubscribes. Um, I was going to do like publishing um, multiple data points in a method, but I think that should be left up to the user. And we're just going to implement a very like low level specification in this, and then people can implement whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And then um, it's going to be hardware agnostic as well, so it'll work with Ethernet hopefully and other interfaces aside from Wi-Fi eventually. And um, just the next two days are finishing up writing tests. We're going to do like write a black box test for it and then write the test that communicates with Adafruit.io and then get the initial PR in and start adding it to like uh, Adafruit.io CircuitPython and Azure IoT CircuitPython. So we'll finally have MQTT in CircuitPython. Right on. All right, uh, sounds great. So uh, Seagrover is lurking. Um, I have some notes in the notes doc from Dakota Redstone, which I will read off. Received assembled Adabox 12 Pygamer. Haven't done any programming yet. Received and haven't set up Py4, so more distraction, smiley face. Some small progress on project trash fish like thing and not holding the forces of chaos at bay, hoping to change that uh, winky face. All right, thank you. Um, next up is Dan. Okay, so I've been working on just one thing for days, which is um, BLE Central. And um, it turns out that I thought it was almost done, but it turns out we need to do something called uh, descriptor discovery. The central part needs to talk to the peripheral to find out um, something called descriptors. And then I can set, need to set one of those descriptors so that I can get uh, notifications automatically when uh, some piece, a piece of data is written so that I can buffer up stuff. And so I've been working on that, and it's just very slow debugging, but I think it's it's almost there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, I had hoped to get Central done last week, but I think I can have it done this week and have a UART server working over BLE in both directions. So right now I have two NRF52840 feathers talking to each other. One is a client and one is a server. One is a peripheral and one is a central, I mean. Uh, hopefully we'll have some demo about that soon, maybe even by Wednesday, but I'll see. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next up is Jerry. Oh, it's been a... Couple of whirlwind couple of weeks. I uh, finally retired from my, my day job. Congratulations. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, enjoying it very much, although it now means that I can start about 30 years of deferred maintenance on my house. My dad just and, did the uh, same thing. <laughs> I've got a honeydew list you wouldn't believe. Yeah. And uh, so um, that's been fun and keep me busy. And there should be lots more Circuit Python time coming up. Um, just we'll see. And uh, Looking forward to more playtime. 
Excellent. Well, congratulations, and uh, we are Thanks. looking forward to seeing you back around more. <laughs> Happy to be here. All right, and that is status updates. Yes. Um, so next up is in the weeds. Uh, this is where we defer more longer form discussions um, that may or may not have come out of status updates. In this case, uh, we have one posted in here that did not come out of status updates that I happen to know was posted this weekend. Um, so I will turn it over to Dan to talk about that. So this is just a question of where we do some documentation about how to build CircuitPython. Um, someone submitted uh, a pull request to add some information about building on Arch Linux. And then I noticed that um, the, uh, the readme about how to build CircuitPython that's in the source code is pretty out of date in a number of ways. Um, and so the question is really is, a long time ago, I wrote a building circuit Python learn guide, which is pretty easy to maintain and I try to keep it up to date. It's harder for people to contribute to it. It's easier to update than submitting a pull request. So the question is where should that information, if that information should probably be only in one place or maybe it should, could be in two places, but we just have to make sure that they're updated. And it would be, it's gonna be pretty duplicative. So where um, should that be? So Summersoft had a response to that, which is from an ease of maintenance pers perspective, it'd be easier to point to the learn guide in the readme and have only one set of instructions to maintain. Yeah, that's what I, that's my, exactly my feeling. So I wonder so, if anyone else has different opinions. I think the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, go ahead, Scott. I was going to say, I have an issue with the that learn guides are hard for other people to contribute to. And so I, kind of what, what I would propose is let's leave the learn guide as like the common path for how to get things going. But when mm -hmm. it comes to like individual Linux builds, let's like let's have the guide link out to something in the repo that like for the advanced cases or the like really detailed instructions really people quiet. go to. Is, uh, I'm missing something. Uh, I don't know. How are you? Can, can Jerry not hear me? Uh, I heard you before, then all of a sudden it cut out. Are you are you speaking now? <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell if you hear me or not. I don't think he does. You're speaking, I'm not hearing. Oh, okay. Somebody told Jerry to reload in te <laughs> via text. <laughs> That's that's always a good idea. Um, uh, I was gonna say I, I echo Scott's uh, feedback um, for a slightly different reason, but his is also good, and that is that um, there's something really special about being able to end up in a GitHub repo for a project and just have everything you need right there, ready to go. Um, it's something I enjoy as a developer. You know, obviously the guide is good and can be made as useful, but there's there's something about that that I like. So um, whatever I can do to contribute, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to make that possible. So to kind of echo what Summersoft said, um, I think that still applies to having it be in the readme, which is to say ease of maintenance perspective, only one set of instructions to maintain. I think if the one set of instructions is the readme, that's fine. Um, however, I kind of want to combine what everybody has said here and say that I, I think Scott's thought on it is not quite um, solid either in the sense that we want, um, I think we would want only one set of instructions. It doesn't matter which, like, I mean, it matters, but the, the issue is not which set of instructions it is. I think it should only be one though. And so if we are leaning towards there being a lot of good reasons to have all of this in the readme, I think that should be primarily where it is. And I think the learn guide then should link to the readme. Um, because once we start spreading what we're updating, we run into issues where we're not updating everything. Um, things are getting missed and um, it's just not, it's not a good situation. Um, so I, I think, I think having it all in the readme is a great idea for all the reasons that everyone has listed. 
Um, I do think, though, that the README then really needs to be um, worked over uh, and pull everything from the Learn Guide into it and make sure that it's up to date and that sort of thing. And I think we've already had multiple offers to contribute to that, um, in which case it'll probably be a lot easier of a task than to um, have one or two people maintaining the Learn Guide, um, et cetera. So that's my thoughts. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I switched mics, but uh, I, I may have I missed most of what Scott said, so I apologize if I'm repeating anything. Um, I think it, it. You know, at first I was going to opt in and, and you know push for it staying in the learn guide, and, and my reasoning for that was that I think it's really important that whatever instructions be there are vetted and they work because you know indiv different individuals can have really different work environments that nobody else has. So, and I think Dan has done a good job of trying to maintain a, a clear set that work on a standard system. But there's no reason why that can't happen in the README as well, because the README has to be approved, even if, if PRs come in. Mm -hmm. So again, I, I think that it needs to be managed, you know, well, and that, you know, whoever, you know, Dan or somebody should be the, the arbiter who, you know, decides if, 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 if someone's inputs to the README are just too tailored, too specific to their own environment. That's my only concern. I can see so, that. Um, but otherwise, I think you know, it really doesn't make a lot of difference. And, and in some ways, the README might be real, might turn out to be a, a nice, clean place for it. So I, I don't have any problem with that at all. Um, but I think uh, it, the key is that that the instructions that appear to somebody who just goes and grabs it should be um, well vetted. <laughs> and I think that's something we can definitely do. Um, it's just a matter of making sure that we do it. Well, I also think there's a long tail. Like there are per board instructions in the NRF port. Like, like. Yeah, those are also out of date. <laughs> right. Right. Well, right. But but yeah. do you want to claim that they're not? Like like are those the things that we should make sure that they're maintained as well? Like this is yeah. why I'm okay having the learn guide be. This is the core that we know works, and then we can kick out to the repo for the details. Well, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking that it is nice. Uh, right. I agree. I think that. I think it's good to have some duplication because I think people who are just getting started might find the learn guide easier because we could have more graphics, screenshots, and whatever. I don't remember if there's anything all that interesting in there, but um, I think what I, maybe I'll take a, upon myself to. Um, to update the README and also to, to, to make sure that they're synced as much, at least in the core part, and to provide reminders in each place that if you update, if one is updated, the other should be updated too. And I know we can't do that. We'd have to do that manually, but it's not that big a guide. I mean, I think there's some other arguments about um, what whether the question is whether if somebody who's building it is actually all that familiar with looking at source code in github and being familiar with sort of that culture and sometimes people want to build it because and they just they, they don't know where to get started right so i think it's still good to have something if you just point into a file in a, in a readme then it's assuming a certain level of familiarity that they might not have. So, so I, I'd like to have something, a start, a beginner's guide at least. And I think, I think you've, I, I mean, I think you kind of nailed it. I think that having what, what Scott is suggesting, um, which is the core bit that works. So the people who just want to build it, who don't know what they're doing, um, can have a more learn guide environment than trying to sort through a readme. Um, it's learn. just, it's just a matter of keeping things synced essentially yeah 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 and i mean we already do that i mean we already like we have learn guides and we have co code in libraries we have examples in libraries and we, we don't expect to just to say oh we're not going to have learn guides because all the code for a library should be in the library or the only instructions for a library should be in a library that's just not who we're catering to so um you know there were already cases this is a case where you need a little more sophistication but still as little as possible. All right. So I'll try to make, I'll try to figure out how to make them both coexist. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Chadney? Yes. 
I think I'm just to put my two bits in. One of the important things is you need a place where you can find find out what are the basic tools you need to uh, to do a build. You know the com the common tools that every build is going to need, and that and that that really should be in a in the learn uh, in a learn guide. And I, th you know I think I'm that's I think that's what we're saying is going to happen. Okay. Yeah. That sounds that sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Because that was my exper experience at first, finding out what tools I needed it was a little uh, a little hard at first, but uh, yeah, once I realized the learn guide had it had it, it worked well. So thank you. Okay. Bye. Excellent. Bye. Yep, sounds good. That's that's kind of the plan. Um, so next up, um, I have something from TG Techie. Uh, would you like to talk about it? Sure. Um, so I, I've been delving into Python books while I've been away. And I saw that uh, C Python uses absap, uh, the, sorry, ab syntax trees. Um, and then I noticed that in CircuitPython, the built-in compile function is missing. I was curious if CircuitPython uses it and beyond space, if there was a reason it was excluded. Uh, what does what does compile do? It takes um, either just a string as Python source code or um, AST right. and turns it into bytecode. Yeah, I mean, we fundamentally under the hood have that the, have that capability. I don't know if we actually have an intermediate AST structure though. Um, I've actually been looking at some of this myself because I want to do AST based editing basically on mobile. Um, but yeah, I haven't. I I kind of expect that in the Circuit Python internals, there's no good boundary between um, like. The parse tree and the VM uh, bytecode output, but I could be wrong. Um, I know there's a hierarchical structure called raw code, um, but they're not. It's not really an AST at all. Okay. Um, Is that like the um, what's it called syntax tree in C Python? Maybe. Yeah, it's similar. It's basically like it's a combination of bytecode and a const table so like things that that bytecode references um that's i think that's the data structure that the parser will output um but yeah i i think the gist is is that like i don't think we actually ever have an ast um that so it wouldn't be just as simple as like binding into the python land for that mm. um, okay what are you what are you trying to do with it or are you just curious uh I'm always just curious, um, okay. but um, two things. One, it looked like you could kind of privatize code if you didn't want people messing with inside bits. Um, and hmm. two, for what I've been doing, I'm looking for modifying the syntax, not of whole changing how it works, but just making it easier to do one thing a bunch of times one off. Does that make sense? Hmm. Um, like instead of, uh, I'm, hmm. like, I'll try to think of a better way to explain it. Um, okay. And I'll bring it back up if it comes. Right. Well, I mean, it. like we would not change syntax stuff from C Python. Like that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely not something we would do. That doesn't mean you couldn't do it in your own fork, but we would definitely not do that. That's why I was curious about ASTs because it works in Python, but it can also parse other things. Hmm. Does that make sense? Did I? I don't know. I don't know exactly what you okay. mean by that. Would you like parse it yourself and then give Python the equivalent AST? Is that what yes. you're saying? Yes. Hmm. Well, you could always transform it in text. Mm -hmm. 
And like as Summersaw was pointing out, like eval is essentially compile, except it's going to run it straight away. Okay. Thank you. I think. Mm -hmm. I'll. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Um, and that is what we have for in the weeds. So I think we are good to wrap up. Um, this has been the CircuitPython Weekly for July 8th, 2019, pretty sure. Um, we are here every week, um, except when it moves uh, to uh, due to US holidays, but we will keep you posted on that. Um, no changes for the next few foreseeable weeks. Um, we are here every Monday from are at rather 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, and if um, if you want to check us out on, uh, we have all of these posted on YouTube. Um, we also have them on podcasts. Um, so if you are um, into either of the, oh, we also have notes. So if you would rather just read up on what the meeting was about, that's also an opportunity. Um, and we have uh, time codes in the notes. So if you are scanning through it and find something you're interested in, um, you can just go right to that point um, and check it out. Um, and then uh, perhaps skip over the parts that don't interest you as much. Um, and anyway, uh, this has been our CircuitPython Weekly. I wanna thank everyone for participating and thank our community for being amazing um, and continuing to make CircuitPython great and make everything we do worth it. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.